Good morning. Thank you for joining me this Easter morning. I pray that you're having a blessed day so far, a beautiful day. Um, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer to begin this morning. As we do, I want us to remember what this Resurrection Sunday is all about in light of so many things going on in our world, so many things going on around us, fires in several places around the country uh, that are damaging and have caused great harm and, and loss of life, as well as around the world, all the turmoil that's going on, that Jesus Christ in his resurrection will bring us hope, bring us victory. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for all that you do for us. God, I pray that as we celebrate today your resurrection from the grave, we look at our life and we look at the things going on in the world and we see how they are but a vapor, but a blot in history compared to the magnificent things that you have done for us and what is to come. And Lord, I pray that in your resurrection we find hope, we find a future, and we find your plan for each of our lives to be resurrected from our old self to a new person changed by your spirit. We ask all this in your name. Amen. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. lost their dearest friend all that he'd said but now he was dead I guess this is how it would end the dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed now he was dead and gone the garden the jail the hammer the nail how could the night be so long? Then came the morning, the night turned into day. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn. Then came 
shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. The angel, the star, the kings from afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. All that he'd done now she'd seen her own son wasted before his time. She knew it was true, she'd watched him die too. She'd heard them call him just a man. But deep in her heart she knew from the start somehow her son would live again. Then came the morning, night turned in the deep. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn. Then came the morning, the shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. Then came the morning, the night turned into deep. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn. Shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost and life had won. For morning had come. Death had lost and life had won. For morning had come. Morning had come. For morning had come. As we come together this morning, I'd ask that you would turn to Colossians 2. I know probably uh, looked at as... as probably a strange place to look this morning from the scripture when we're talking about a resurrection Sunday. But Jesus Christ was resurrected um, for many reasons. The main reason was to show his power o over death and over hell. And, and he, uh, it is said in the scriptures, went into the depths or into hell it's himself and came back and was, was resurrected so that he showed victory over all those things. We know uh, many of us, uh, most of you who are watching this morning and listening, you know the story. Uh, last week, we talked about Jesus coming in to the city of Jerusalem in a triumphal way uh, with the people praising him and, and singing his praises and shouting his praises. We know about the things he did through the week. He drove the money changers from the temple. He healed many people. He spoke to his disciples. He spoke to the, the Pharisees and many of the folks there in Jerusalem who were not really sure about him and not really uh, sold on what he was doing. Some knew exactly who he was uh, and were following him and others knew exactly who he was and they were planning to kill him. We know how Judas has come to this point where he has sold Jesus Christ literally to the Pharisees for 30 pieces of silver. We have seen the the lord's supper we call it or the last supper where jesus and his uh disciples share in a time a breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup just before he is to be crucified and he warns them of that and he says that somebody's going to betray me and they're all beside themselves as to who that might be knowing that in their own way every single one of them betrayed him to a degree and so then he goes to the garden of gethsemane and he weeps those drops of blood as it says from his brow and praying that God would take this cup from him, but not his will, 
God's will be done. And all the while, the disciples could only sleep. Isn't that indicative of the way we are in this world today? Jesus is calling for us to sit with him a while, to work with him to do his will on this earth in the kingdom of God. And in so many ways, at least spiritually, we sleep. Jesus then was beaten. He was taken by the betrayal of Judas to the Sanhedrin, who then tortured him, beat him, um, and uh, tormented him only to have to take him to Pilate because Pilate had the final say. And they brought him to the place where he was convicted. They couldn't find anything to really convict him on, so they just uh, allowed it to be done. There was no real basis for any of it. We know all of those things, but then later on, the quandary of the church was about the resurrection. Folks, without the resurrection, there is no hope. There is nothing apart from the resurrection because there were other prophets that said they were good, said that they knew what they were talking about, said they were from God or that they had some special revelation. But when they died, they buried their bones and they stayed buried. Jesus being resurrected from the tomb is the primary staple and foundation of everything we believe. Without that, there is no real hope. And we know that it happened because of all the witnesses that saw him alive over a period of time. In light of that, Paul is talking to the Christians at Colossae, and he speaks to them, and he says in chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, but by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to shame by triumphing over them in him. First and foremost, um, he's speaking to those who have received Christ. I'm speaking to you this morning. If you have received Christ, you are called to walk in him, to abide in him, to live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you because he loved you. If you were the only person, the only person who ever had sin in your life, Christ would have died for you on that cross. He would have let them beat him, scourge him, punish him, persecute him, spit on him, ridicule him, and hang him on that cross to get rid of your sin, to die for your sin. And that's what he did. And knowing that he rose from the grave, that his resurrection is true because of the vast number of witnesses that saw it, and by the fighting of the others to squelch it, we know that it is true. And you can believe in that. You can trust in that as your Lord and Savior. And I'm calling on you to do that today if you never have. You know, the missionary pastor from Taiwan said, the way they know what the communists in China are up to is they don't listen to the communists in China. They listen to the people they are trying to silence. If Jesus did not really die on the cross, if he really was still in that tomb, 
Why did the Pharisees go to such great lengths to cover it up? Why did they go to such great lengths to prove it wrong? All they had to do was look in that tomb and see that he was gone. All they had to do was check out those disciples and eventually somebody would have spilled the beans. But you know what? They didn't because it was true. And the Pharisees fell on their faces because they themselves knew it was true. They just didn't want the people to know that. So we're being called to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are also being called to walk in Him or to abide in Him and to be a part of the salvation He gives us in living it out. And He gives a warning here and He says, don't be led astray. We've talked in the last few weeks about uh, false prophets, about wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, we're talking here about the Pharisees. You know, Caiaphas, the Pharisees, they were terrible about this. They were uh, they were Caiaphas and Annas. They were sitting there with all these people there. And when Jesus said, they, they confronted him about, you know, was he the son of God? And he says, it is as you say, or using the words I am in such a way that it it would be, if it were you or me saying it in that context, it would have been blasphemy. And Caiaphas tore his coat. He tore his clothes, which was a sign of great uh, mourning and brokenness from rebellion of this blasphemy. It was an indication that this man had blasphemed God. He didn't tear his clothes because Jesus blasphemed, and he didn't tear his clothes because Jesus was speaking heresy. He tore his clothes because he wanted the people to think that Jesus was blaspheming and teaching heresy. He wanted them to think that's what he believed. It was all drama because it was all part of his plan to get rid of Jesus. And he was leading the people astray and he has led an entire nation of people astray to not believe the Messiah that God not only promised for generations and decades, the prophets predicted him coming, every prophetic teaching about him coming was fulfilled in the life of Christ, and every prophecy about his death, burial, resurrection, and everything else about him, every single prophecy of the prophets that the Jews taught their people came to pass in the life of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them. Hundreds of prophecies that talk about the birth, life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ all came to pass in his life. And yet there are those that would lead us astray. There are those that would drive us off into some other way of thinking apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ in a earthly tradition. What does it say? What does it say there? Um, uh, let no one take you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. They're going to use the elemental spirits of the world. What is that? C could that be science? They're going to use science that God himself created to twist and turn away, to leave you, lead you away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, tell you the Bible isn't true. You know, every time they've tried to use science to prove the Bible wrong, the Bible was proved right. Don't let people deceive you. Don't let people draw you away by elemental spirits of the world or by the, the human uh, ideas don't be led astray. Follow Jesus Christ and trust him. He not only gave us this call, not only did we receive him, but he redeemed us, not just in the flesh, but in the spirit. See, the Jews had their physical ritual, circumcision and those things that were physical rituals they went to. Paul is telling us that Jesus broke down all of that stuff in a spiritual term. We were it, it, for lack of a better term, ritualized by the circumcision of our spirit and our heart, not the physical body. And we have been redeemed by that, and it cancels out our debt of sin by him dying on the cross. said he nailed it to the cross. Later on, it says, and by doing so, he put the authorities to shame. You know why? Because they said he's not who he said he is. But you know what? He proved them to be false prophets. Because they said he's nothing, he's nobody, he's going to die, we're going to kill him, we're going to get rid of him. But he rose again, and he put them to shame. Paul is talking to these people of Colossae. They have received Christ. 
He wants them to know that they have been redeemed by his dying on the cross and that his, their sins he nailed to the cross, but that they also followed him in baptism, which was a spiritual thing, not just a physical thing. Now, baptism is a, a physical thing. Physically, you are dipped into the water. The word baptism does not mean just that something is dipped. The thing which is dipped is that which is being baptized. So if you dip a, a dipper in the water and pour it over someone's head, that is not baptism. The dipper was baptized, not the person you poured the water over. If you take that person and you dip them into the water, they are baptized. And it is symbolic of the death and burial and then the resurrection of Christ walking out of that tomb. It's symbolic that that has taken place in our life spiritually by what he has done in our life and that we follow him in baptism and it becomes a spiritual thing that we are now baptized falling, following him. It puts off the rituals. It's not the ritual of circumcision that saved anyone. It's not the ritual of baptism that saves someone. It's not the ritual of taking the bread and the cup that saves us. Those are symbols of physical symbols that we do, that we take place in our life or have taken place in the lives of the Jews who trusted God. Those are physical things that take place in our life that show as a symbol the spiritual things that God has done within us through the power of Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit. So we're to put off all of those rituals. He goes on further to talk about eating certain things and drinking certain things. And he says, you, you can't be caught up in all of those ritualistic things because Jesus nailed those to the cross. We have got to follow Jesus Christ in what he told us to do. What did he tell us to do? Because we are free from the law, we are free from the sin that, that besets us. We wouldn't know about the sin if it wasn't for the law. We obey the law, but we obey it because we are spirit-filled by Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. We're not saved because we behave ourselves. We behave ourselves because we're saved. And to be free, truly free, is to do his will and the will of the Father. That's what he frees us up to do. He first and foremost called us in his will and the will of the Father to be holy. In 1 Peter 1 16, it says, be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's a reference to Levitical law. That we're to be holy, we're to be set apart and different. That's what the word holy means. Holy doesn't mean I'm better than you. If I'm trying to be holy, that doesn't mean I'm trying to be better than you. It means I'm trying to be the ideal that God has called me to be. Separate, different, Set apart, not like the world, not a friend of the world, which means enmity with God, but holy and set apart. Doesn't mean blameless. Doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't mean perfect. It means different. It means separated out from the world in such a way that we don't live the way the world wants us to live. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, talking about those things, come out from those people and be separate. It doesn't mean you ignore those people. It doesn't mean that you treat them badly. We have no right whatsoever as Christians to ridicule or look down on anyone who is not a Christian. Far different. We're to love those people because in the, the kingdom of God, they have no idea. They don't know any better. They're lost. He's talking about us as Christians. We are to not... Um, be yoked. He's talking about not being yoked with unbelievers. We shouldn't marry people who, do, who believe differently than we believe about God. We shouldn't marry into relationships, whether it be the marriage relationship or a business relationship or other things with people who do not believe in God and who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Christians, we need to do business with Christians. Christians, we need to support Christian businesses because we need to be yoked with people who are of like mind and like belief. Doesn't mean you can't witness to people who are lost. Doesn't mean you can't go and, and reach out to them and show them Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what it means when it says, as you go, make disciples. But we can't be yoked to them because we are to be abiding in Christ. 
So what are we saying then? What all took place in this Passion Week? Jesus Christ came to this earth. He was God who came physically in an incarnation of human form on this earth. God himself. To give himself as a ransom for all of us so that we would not die and go to hell but that we would live with him in eternity. But it's not just about living with him in eternity. It is about abiding with him on this earth. Those years he spent with those disciples was an example to them about how they should live. The writings of those things and the writings they gave us later in the epistles and in the other writings are to show us how we are to live in light of that. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Everything old is put away and everything's made new. You're not the old man. You're not the old person you used to be. You're a completely new creature. When Jesus Christ walked out of that tomb, he gave us the opportunity to be sons, daughters, heirs of God in Christ you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't know how to give it to you any more simply than that, that Jesus Christ loved us so much that he gave his life for us on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is patient that none would perish but all would come to repentance. You can do that this morning. What a great time to do that in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you would become the resurrected you, new, a new creature, all the old put away, and everything made new. You can do that this morning if you've never done it. If you're a Christian, if you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and you know that he lives in your heart, are you living for him? Are you abiding in him? Are you at one with him in your life? Are you holy? Are you set apart? Are you different? Or are you just floating along living like the world lives? Folks, today is the day to put away the old self, bury it in that tomb, and come out resurrected in a new life, a new person, a new creation. Every day we are given that opportunity. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Everything old is put away and everything's made new. Walk in a new life. Walk in trust, in faith, and the hope of Jesus Christ. This is a beautiful day to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's also a beautiful day to celebrate your resurrection from the dead. Those who were dead in sin who are now alive in Christ. Celebrate with me today. Resurrection Sunday, not just Jesus' resurrection, but our resurrection from dead in sin to alive in Christ. Thank you for listening. If you need to get hold of us in any way, go to jeffgore.org. We would love to hear from you. Have a blessed week. Have a wonderful Resurrection Sunday. Come back and see us next week. We'd love to hear from you.